Amazing. Welcome, 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 world, <laughs> to the University of the Underground Moon Orchestra Whistleblowing Program. <laughs> I am Aditi Jagannathan, um, Dr. Aditi Jagannathan, um, the head of this incredible program. I am a writer, an academic, a educator, and most importantly, a dreamer. Um, and it's such an honor to, to be curating this program and to be kind of assembling, you know, this beautiful body of people into this space. So big up and thank you to everyone at the University of the Underground. So, just to give you a little bit of context, the University of the Underground was founded in February 2017 as a charity, and it is an incredible, free, pluralistic, transnational, decolonial university based in the night in the basement, sorry, of nightclubs, which is pretty darn cool for a university. <laughs> typically quite dry, stale spaces, um, but the University of the Underground interrupts all of that stuff. So in this particular two month residency program, we're calling for a really amazing, incredible and radical investigation into the practice of whistleblowing. So we're looking at whistleblowing as this kind of multi-dimensional entity, um, as a political action, but also as an instrument, as an instrument of you know communication but also as an instrument into revealing different truths so without further ado i want to introduce you to the absolutely incredible lizzie burke um, who is decolonial radical an amazing thinker maker and someone who has an absolutely incredible aesthetic practice um, they are a graphic designer and a photographer from London, but currently based in Brussels. And um, Lizzie's lecture is gonna kind of riff off of the labor of love, work, creativity, and power. Lizzie, welcome. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I, um, firstly, I've got, I've just got a little bit to say, like a little bit that I've prepared, um, just because I wanted to start by uh, bringing some stuff to the table, just to frame our conversation a little bit. Um, but uh, if that's okay with everyone, so I'll, I'll just start with a little bit. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, and I'm going to be reading from my notes to start with. Um, uh, just because there's no saying where we'll end up if I don't, so I'm just going to do that. Uh, and, and obviously feel free um, to ask questions, raise points, and I'll just do my best to respond. Um, when I'm in this situation and someone says, oh, you know, feel free to ask questions or like raise your voice or whatever, um, personally, I can get a little bit caught up in thinking about how I'm going to articulate my point, um, but also feel free to bring stuff that's a little bit mushy or half-baked, uh, and maybe we can kind of help each other to sort of tease it out a little bit, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer and I'm a photographer. Um, oh, I should... I should introduce myself properly. So I, I've got brown hair and glasses and, a, and I'm wearing a black top. And I'm speaking to you from my living room in Brussels. Um, so yeah, I'm a graphic designer and a photographer. Uh, and I went to university to study design and I got a degree. Um, and I have worked in the field in which I've trained, more or less. Um, so just to start by talking about my work history, uh, I had a paper round from about the age of 13. Um, and then one of my first jobs was in a cafe at around the age of 16. <clears throat> and that was in the early 2000s. So at that time, we were wearing flared jeans and we had like choker necklaces and it wasn't really cool to crimp your hair anymore, but we straightened our hair a lot um, or just like gelled it down to our heads and left like two little strands. Um, so it was around that time. 
uh, and I got a job at this cafe in a shopping arcade. Um, and for whatever reason, the manager of the cafe was was hardly ever there. Um, and it was all it was all like women and girls who worked there. Um, and we were from totally different walks of life, different ages, at different moments in our lives. Um, and we bonded. I felt like we bonded and, and we, we backed each other up if customers ever complained. Um, and we worked, but we didn't really work hard. <laughs> um, and at the time I was, at, I was at sixth form and I was working between like two and three days a week um, in between my studies and, and getting up to no good. Um, because of the camaraderie, I enjoyed my job. And I didn't really feel like I needed to pretend that I loved the work. Um, so uh, I was relaxed and honestly a little bit lazy. <laughs> um, and then one day uh, I had to, I had an errand to run to go and pick up some, some cakes from a place around the corner. Um, and one of the other girls said that she wanted to come with me just to have a cigarette on the way. Um, and while we were walking there, she said to me, uh, Tony's going around saying you bat for both sides. <laughs> so Tony was one of the other girls who worked in this cafe and we went to school together. Um, and I don't remember how, how she started this conversation, but I do remember those exact words. And I've got a really bad memory, so I think it must have marked me. <laughs> so she said, Tony's going around saying you bat for both sides. And she was telling me this and I felt her, she was searching my face to, for my reaction um, because she wanted to give me the chance to deny it, this thing that she saw as, as a, a kind of slander against my name. Um, and I felt, I just felt my world kind of melting a little bit before my eyes because I couldn't deny it because it was true, um, but I knew that it would destroy those relationships that I'd created um, with my colleagues if I, if I admitted it. Um, anyway, a few, a few weeks later, I was sacked. <laughs> and I think that I, I deserved to be sacked because I was lazy. But on those grounds, quite a few of us also deserved to be sacked, um, but it was just me. And after that, I got the message. Um, and I probably, I wouldn't have been able to articulate this with my voice at the time, um, but I knew it in my heart and in my body. Um, I got the message that I'm not safe at work um, and that I will, I'll, I will not be given any affordances if I mess up. Um, and from that moment on, I didn't really feel secure in work. Um, I didn't think that I could play the game. Um, I had quite a self-destructive attitude at work. Um, at the same time as, as kind of holding on to work really tightly because, um, because I was kind of fearful of losing it. Um, and it mattered to me. My work was and still is really important to me. Uh, so it kind of became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that the thing I feared happening would happen, like in different ways, but it would happen. Um, and I would have been considered outwardly as kind of not a team player. But the thing is, I really am a team player. <laughs> I just couldn't play that game. And perhaps more than most of my colleagues, I would have stuck up for the people around me. Um, so anyway, fast forward a little bit. And I got three jobs like someone being dragged through a prickly hedge backwards. Um, it's a bit taboo to kind of talk about being demotivated at work and yet it's really really a universal experience um, and each time that I witnessed uh, discriminatory behavior at work it kind of went through me like an electric shock um, and then I reached a point where I was working for a union doing campaign communications and it was the best job that I've ever had really like I loved it um, but with this union job, I, I, I got to travel all over the world um, and I, would, I was 
meeting people who were trying to build unions or who were in a union and who were fighting for better conditions for themselves or their, co their co-workers, often in, in really hostile settings. I mean, like more, a lot worse than it is in the UK and, and Europe. Um, and it was a massive privilege and a, and a really priceless political education for me because I met people from all over the place, all different religions, ages, cultures, all committed to the same thing, which is the protection and improvement of the lives of working people. And I knew that I was in the right place and I was really learning from everyone around me. Um, so time went on and there were some changes at the top and someone came in who had a very different, and that's all I'll say, <laughs> Uh, vision of what communications should be and they wanted us to be doing PR really rather than the kind of grassroots stuff that was needed um, and I'd been there a relatively short time but my boss who had had to fight for every tiny little resource to try to build the team um, had been there for, for close to two decades um, and her and my other co-workers had given so much to the organization and now here they were kind of messing with our jobs without like, you know, as if it was nothing. Um, so that kind of disloyalty and disrespect that I saw was unacceptable to me. <laughs> uh, and it's something really that I'd seen, you know, I'd seen my parents suffer as public sector workers, um, really brought low by austerity politics and Beyond them, my granny, who had worked for the post office, and she was a single mother in the 1960s, uh, and things were made very difficult for her. Um, so it was really an abuse of power. And although it was the best job that I'd ever had, there was really no way that I could stand by and watch as my co-workers were treated with such contempt. Um, and over a period of months, we underwent a really humiliating review process <clears throat> where people would come in and observe how we did things and give their recommendations for what needed to change. Um, some of whom I actually respect and said some quite sensible things. Um, but when those people didn't give the, the kind of required answers, they brought in people who had no idea really um, to give the answers that they wanted um, and to tell us what, what they think we should do. Um, so we reached a point where out of a team of seven, four of us had decided that we'd had enough and we were going to leave. Uh, and that's four people who had been completely committed to our work. Um, I loved my job and I worked hard, uh, but, but we ended up unionizing. And we were, we were members of the union already. Um, but there's a difference between there's definitely a difference between like paying your subs every month and going to the meetings and actually putting it all into practice. So a lot of stuff happened, just going to skip over some things. Um, and eventually it reached a moment where we had kept it a secret that we wanted to leave. Um, but we, we reached a point where we'd been given a deadline one morning by one of the directors to declare if we wanted to leave. Um, and on that morning, we decided that we would all declare it together, all four of us. And I remember sitting in a meeting room in the basement of the building that we worked in with them. And we made a phone call to the director to say that we wanted to come together and he refused. Um, he refused to meet us as a group and he wanted to meet with us individually. So one by one, we had to meet him in his office and we each took our, our union rep with us who was the same guy, so he came to all of those meetings. Um, and the director, he was shocked. Um, they were so shocked and angry that they wanted to put us on gardening leave there and then, and for us to leave that same day. And I had worked there just for a few years, but my co-workers had worked there for two decades, and our combined experience was something around 50 years working for this organisation, and they just wanted to shove us out of the door like criminals. So we declined the offer to leave that day. Uh, and we said that we would tie up loose ends as much as possible um, and leave a few days later. <clears throat> and it was a shock because none of us had done anything wrong. Like 
we were ready to work out our notice periods and leave peacefully. But because we'd been through this process together, we needed to end it together. So at four o'clock on a Thursday, just before the end of November, the four of us walked out of the building together and uh, everyone in the building, all of our co-workers who were really disgusted by what they saw, um, had come to clap us out of the building, <clears throat> which was awesome. Um, but at the time, I should say that I was, I was fearful because I don't have a safety net in life. I don't come from money and it's not an option for me to go and live with my mum or dad. Obviously, I have friends who would never let me go to the streets and I've lived on benefits before. But uh, yeah, it was I was fearful. Um, and in the end, we did we did get some settlement money. But it, at that point, it was not a sure thing. Um, but as we walked out and with all that clapping and everything, um, I really felt the power rushing into my body from my legs upwards, like adrenaline or whatever it was. But it was really an amazing feeling. And I can honestly say I haven't felt anything like that before. Um, so since then, I went freelance and I have a much healthier relationship with work as a result. Um, I work hard and I enjoy my work, but when I have work, I work. And when I don't have work, I don't pretend that I'm working. <laughs> Uh, I enjoy that. So yeah, I do my things. Um, obviously, the settlement money allowed me to go freelance because I could get myself set up and reach out to clients, and that takes time. Um, but more than that, much much more importantly than that, it really healed something in me, where since I had that stupid cafe job, I'd felt alone in all of my jobs, and like my coworkers wouldn't ever stick up for me like I would for them. Um, so the solidarity that we felt among ourselves was so healing um, for all of us, really. We're all quite different people and we've got very different sensibilities and backgrounds and stuff. Um, but the power that we had together and the solidarity that we shared make us like kind of made us feel like we could do anything, really. Um, like one of them said to me afterwards, from now on, I know that you would throw down for me and I would throw down for you. <laughs> That's how she put it. Um, and it's true. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about unionizing today because I think that it's a form of whistleblowing. Um, if we think about the word and the act of whistleblowing, there's this release of pressure, but there's also an unleashing of energy that is unpredictable and that can take us somewhere that we might not be ready for. So for me, it's not just about blowing the roof off a situation, it's also about the manner and the tactics that we use to survive when we're living under a neoliberal economic ideology. And when you find your people who you can bring your complete self to sit with, there's a letting off of steam that I think is vital to our survival. And it's not only about the whistleblowing, is also about creating those breathing spaces for ourselves. So whistleblowing is an unleashing of power and unionizing is a way of building power collectively. We all have the right to build a union in our workplace. The union at its most fundamental is, is the collective voice of all of the workers. And it's a mechanism for those people to have some say in the way that their workplace is run. And it is built on some fundamental rights that we all have because of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, because of the, the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights of 1966, various ILO conventions. The ILO is the International Labour Organization um, responsible for labour standards. Um, and our trade union rights are also written into the European Convention on Human Rights of 1951. <laughs> so, what creates a breathing space? So for me, it's, it's when we show solidarity and generosity to one another. It's when we allow creativity as an unpredictable force to take us somewhere new. Uh, and it's, it's those moments and spaces where we can express all of our multitudes, because I think we're all multitudes. And I feel good in myself when I can express that, when I can say I'm these things and I'm these things too. And I think that there's a link between this singular 
chopping down of who you are and the need to sell yourself in a market economy. Um, we need to have a singular trade. And in school, we're meant to focus on what our studies will create for us as a trade. So we get the message from a young age in our schooling that creativity is useful, but it's a force that needs to be tamed. And in the workplace, I think we're often discouraged from expressing our multitudes and it can make us really unhappy. Yes, you need to have your sound, your signature, your style, and that's about having artistic integrity and originality brings you the respect of your peers. But it's not just about having your own voice. It's also about having something to position you in a market economy. And I think it's not easy, but we have to keep sight of that. Am I doing this from a place of personal integrity or am I doing it from a place of needing to distinguish myself in a market economy? And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in that, that's the game. And we all have to make a living. But if you don't keep that distinction in sight, then I think you can lose yourself a little bit in the process. So we go from playing to needing to focus our studies to positioning ourselves in a market economy, but the forces of the market economy can shift and our skills can be made redundant or we can just be unemployed, right? So spaces where we can bring all of our multitudes are breathing spaces. A lot of people in the UK, especially, have a perception of trade unions that, that is from another era, that it's very male and macho, that it's for factory or heavy industry workers. But for me, the most effective union organizers I've met have been women, women who do things a bit differently because the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house, right? So in the unionizing and in the campaigning, there's so much room for creativity because you do it how you do it. The banners you paint and the language you use and the songs that you invent. And I just wanna mention a moment I had a few years ago um, because British Airways cabin crew had a dispute with management a few years ago about the two-tiered contract system that they were creating. Because it's quite common nowadays that employers will try to introduce precarity into their workforce, into their employment systems to save money off the backs of their employees, basically. Um, so, so if you say a workforce of a thousand people, they're all on, on like full-time permanent contracts, um, will become a workforce of 750 people on full-time permanent contracts and then 250 people on so-called flexible contracts, which, are, which give them less pay and worse conditions. Um, and that is spoken of by management as flexibility, but by anyone else as precarity. And in effect, um, you'll have people doing the same job, working side by side, but on totally different contracts different pay, different terms for holiday and sickness. And so that's basically what was happening at British Airways. <clears throat> and so those cabin crew saw that it was unfair and that also British Airways as a legacy airline present themselves with some kind of prestige and dignity while treating their workers without any respect and forcing them into indignity through low pay and poor conditions. So they had a long, dispute with management and at some point in the campaign um, the cabin crew were on strike um, and so some British Airways planes were grounded and they couldn't fly so Qatar Airways stepped in and offered to wet lease their planes to, to BA um, so wet leasing that basically means that Qatar Airways planes plus their workers would operate BA flights and that, that was a way of undermining the strike, basically. Um, so the cabin crew organized to have an action outside of Qatar Airways headquarters. Um, and I went down there with a colleague to do some interviews. Um, Qatar Airways headquarters is in, in West London next to a bypass. <clears throat> but before we could see the protest, we could hear it because they had a speaker on a little trolley and they were blasting out um, 
Ride on Time by Black Box with Loletta Holloway. Uh, and I turned the corner and there were young men dancing with Unite the Union flags. Um, and it was a hot day and there were people voguing to the music and they'd made really beautiful banners with fluorescent ink and glitter. And they were just being bombastically camp um, and it was beautiful. And they were probably being, being like that more so because it was Qatar Airways headquarters. And I just thought this is really where I need to be. So <clears throat> I just want to finish um, by reading something that the photographer Deanna Lawson said recently in an interview with Aperture magazine. Um, I really, really like her work and recommend looking her up if you don't know it. And if you're in London, I think you can see a show of hers at the Photographer's Gallery at the moment because she got nominated for the Deutsche Börse Prize this year. So she said in, in, in this interview, um, <clears throat> One of my earliest memories as a child is trying to build a flying car with my twin sister, Dana. I remember pulling all these things out of the back room from my toy box, and I was so excited that we were going to rig up something that could elevate us off the ground and have us float off into the sky. I had a lunchbox for a seat and some rope and some other gadgets, but the more we started to work on it, the more I became overwhelmed that we were that we that what we were trying to make wasn't going to happen. A slow seeping disappointment settled in that we didn't have the knowledge to use the materials that we had in our bedroom to make us levitate. So one of my earliest impulses was to make something happen. And I really, I just really identify with this feeling of being so energized by an energized by an idea um, of allowing our imaginations to take us somewhere new but then being kind of disappointed because it will never be as amazing as it is in our imaginations and I think where when we're trying to change things when we're creating things making things adjusting pushing ourselves forward our imaginations can carry us really far and we shouldn't be disheartened if it's not exactly how we dreamt it was going to be. So two, done. Questions? Oh, Lizzie, that was so, so beautiful, my love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing so much poetry and emotion and depth and heart and spirit um damn i want to unionize with you <laughs> <laughs> i want you to be my ride or die <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah you touched on so much actually you know and you know what is this kind of act of unionizing but a group of people coming together and orbiting around a dream orbiting around a vision orbiting around a future that is so much more than the present and in that orbit there's this kind of fervent belief that that future can be actualized right that that future can be materialized otherwise we wouldn't be gathering you know we wouldn't be organizing um and yeah i really love the way that you you talked about the affect of that as well you know, how does it feel? And like, yeah, throughout um, your beautiful, beautiful talk, you were, you, you kind of brought this embodied approach as well, which I think can be, can be so often disavowed, actually, when we think about unionizing, unionizing, when we think about, you know, the political, when we think about kind of a socialist kind of consciousness, the, the body, the emotion, all of these kind of deeply human things get kind of placed on the periphery. But actually we need those things to sustain it, right? Because as we all know, like any kind of activist work, you know, as energizing as it can be, it can be deeply exhausting and traumatizing and re-traumatizing in so many different ways. So if we don't like kind of embody the spirit of, of those people that you were kind of bringing into the space when they were like voguing <laughs> you know and singing and like vibing to to music and vibing to each other 
then you know we can't continue the work right we can't continue the legacies of our ancestors um so i really really love like that that kind of that 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 kind of ethos and that ethic that you brought into the space. It's, it's really, really powerful. Um, yeah, there's so much, there's so much. I don't want to take up space. So <laughs> I know, I know you've all got really, really interesting questions and yeah, things that you might want to reflect on or share with, with Lizzie. So um, yeah, I'll open it up to, to the beautiful orchestra. Um, thank you so much for your vulnerability. I feel like spaces where we can breathe and be vulnerable together are part of that orbit. So I really appreciate you sharing everything. I think one thing you talked about was like the shape shifting between personal integrity and then the marketplace and the economy as an artist and then like focusing and also playing. Um, I guess a question I have for you is how do you balance that personal integrity when we have to survive in the place of economy? And as you work to keep your personal integrity, integrity, like what are ways that like we can continue to do that so we can actually shift the market economy and just obliterate it in total or any ways that you reflect on that and we all do. Shall I answer or should you, yeah, should I answer? Okay, cool. <clears throat> I think, um, that's a question that I ask myself all the time. <laughs> and it's just constantly, that's just constantly in motion, really, particularly because my work is a bit like that anyway. Um, but uh, I think I try to give my work a different, a different measure that is not just money. So to always, and, and th that's hard also because like Aditi mentioned, if you're, if you do kind of, if you get involved in, you know, if you really don't believe in the economic system that we're living under and you get involved with all kinds of kind of different um, community groups and activism and stuff like that, then you really can spend your whole life committed to that. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's little things like someone will ask you to oh, can you design a flyer for, for this protest that we were doing next week and blah, 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 blah. Like, and you can get quite like, um, um, that can really soak up a lot of time. Um, but I do try as much as I can to, um, to, yeah, to like, to give my work a value that is not just money um, by, by still doing stuff for people, like still kind of um, giving a lot of time to just to silly stuff. Sometimes it's just, it, you know, like people ask you to do things and you're like, yeah, sure. And then you end up like, you know, off somewhere in the street. I've ended up in a, on a roundabout in Madrid filming a, a, a van going around the roundabout in like 40 degree heat, thinking like, what am I doing here? But, you know, it's a journey, it's great. Um, but yeah, like I think, and, and also at the end of the day, we, that, that is the game. Like you can't just completely reject it. Like that is what we're living under and we have to pay our rent and, um, and some people are more fortunate in that, in that they don't, they, yeah, they don't have so many money, money worries sort of thing. But yeah, there is a, there's a kind of a, a baseline that you kind of need to survive and then and then above that it's kind of up to you i mean yeah does that answer your question is that enough okay cool. yeah I, I like what you what you said about it being something that you constantly ask yourself um and it makes me think about how you know when we're engaging in you know in in any kind of political work, you know, it's so important for us to have that check-in, you know, for us to be reflexive. And it's not just like, you know, one question, like at the start of every year, it has to be constant and it has to be ongoing. And sometimes it can be discomforting, right? Like kind of having these conversations with ourselves because we kind of, you know, dive deeper into the seabed of our consciousness. <laughs> 
and sometimes that can be like a place full of shadows that we don't want to kind of dive into and we find incongruencies and like tensions and contradictions in ourselves but I think you know if, if we kind of sit with the dialectics within ourselves then it might be easier or maybe less unsettling to grapple with the dialectical kind of dilemmas that we see swirling and whirling through the world right um yeah so i i think that was a, a really kind of a beautiful response to 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 the question but anyway i think i feel like i i feel like i feel it anyway in my body if i'm not doing enough of the stuff that I really do believe in it's I'll I will be down <laughs> in the dumps anyway so like you kind of feel it don't you um yeah I mean it makes it, it that also just made me think about the um because since I've been in Brussels I've been here like a, a year two years and a half something like that and so most of the time that I've been here it's been it's been the pandemic it's been like confinement and stuff um so I haven't really been able to kind of go out and 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 seek out those kind of networks here um, of sort of like union stuff and activism and things like that um, so much. But I through through a friend, I got in got involved in this thing that was for Bolivia. It was like Wipalas por el mundo and it's um, indigenous. It's kind of like a network of indigenous and um, Bolivian people who were all over the place. Um, and I was asked by somebody to go down and interview these women um, who had an action outside of the, the European Commission, which is in Brussels, because it's like it was something to do with, I actually can't quite remember what it was, but there was kind of almost like a, a bit of a kind of political coup there. Although it's it's all kind of like that's all kind of like calmed down a bit now, but um, at the time there were they they'd coordinated to have all of these actions everywhere, um, and I I just turned up um, because a friend asked a friend in London asked me if I could go there and and just interview some people or do some filming, um, and it was it was only like there was only like four or five women there. Um, at this kind of like action uh, in the middle of Brussels but it was just it was it was such a relief to be around people who just believe in a completely different vision <laughs> of our economy of our society of our world um, and it was just such a relief to be around them that I cried <laughs> I cried as I was walking up to them as I saw how they'd set everything out. I cry, cried when I left. <laughs> I didn't cry when I was with them, um, but uh, they just gave me these little, they also just gave me these little, um, some, they were just really, re really grateful that I'd turned up um, to film them and, and to sort of listen to what they had to say. Um, and they gave me some little, these little like cheese bread things. Um, that were like really delicious. And so I just walked away from this thing, like crying and eating this delicious thing. <laughs> but it's like, you know, you need it. I think, I think I really need it to be kind of looped into that kind of thing and to feel like there's other people out there, you know. 100%, um, yeah, that's so beautiful, that kind of connection and how generative it can be. Yeah, I guess it's a reminder that we're all kind of part of this, you know, this, you know, interestingly textured tapestry, right? And when like one thread is loose or one thread is missing, it's not quite right. And like there are ways in which, you know, the skills, the resources, the, the, the gifts that we each have can all kind of complement each other and be part of, of this kind of wider movement. And sometimes we might not even realize how we're contributing, but we are, you know, by just being, by just being engaged, by just being kind of hip to other people and their energies um, and their, their existence, right? 
sectors, you know, and when we think about indigenous communities, when we think about, you know, queer folks, when we think about trans folks, when we think about black and brown people in different parts of the world, you know, like our mere existence has been erased in many different ways, right? So for that existence to be seen, to be affirmed, it's like a refusal it's a refusal of that invisibility it's a refusal of that erasure and going back to what you were saying it's like a, a an utterance of this this defiant act of whistleblowing you know and it might not have the kind of you know the 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 the, the potency that certain kind of you know hugely political gestures of whistleblowing might have, right? When we think about the Assanges and, you know, the Chelsea Mannings of the world, right? But there is a potency to it, you know? And I kind of like that, you know, the the, the quotidian, the everyday utterances of whistleblowing. Um, yeah, and yeah, solidarity, it, sometimes it is just showing up as well, you know, being present, holding someone's hand, giving them a tissue um, if, they're, if they're upset, you know? Um, yeah, and that, that crying is beautiful and it's catharsis and it's, it's beautiful seeing someone cry as well <laughs> in many ways, you know? I think it's something that has been kind of, you know, conceptualized as weakness in, in, in many different ways, but actually it's, so, it's such a sign and symbol of strength and resilience, right? And when we think about the power of water, you know, like scientifically um, and through many different kind of esoteric and cos cos cosmological, you know, viewpoints, water is like really, really potent. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, did anyone else want to want to ask ask Lizzie a question? A CV raising. Hi, um, hi Lizzie. Um, first off, thank you for sharing um, sharing parts of yourself, sh talking about unionizing and yeah, just being here. You know, like it's 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 great because uh, I mean I. I've I've recently joined a union, basically. Um, <laughs> um, it's 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 called the United Voices of the World, um, and I'm part of the a really recent branch called uh, the DC DCW. So it's and coworkers branch of this. So the, for peoples, uh, United Voices of the World is a union that is led by migrant workers um, based in London. Um, it's been there for a while. And I mean, I, I, it's very, very new to me. And so I, I'm very like, I'm so happy that this is something we're talking about because it's something that I'm learning so much from. And I, the branch I joined is thinking a lot about sort of like, the place of artists, creative practitioners, and you know the, the the thinking of ourselves as workers, and what does it mean to mobilize, organize, and be in solidarity with other people working? You know, um, because our work just looks different. And I, I think it, it's really new to me. Like I, it's really really new to me. I just yeah, I joined because I understand the power that is to unionize. To, to, to organize, to gather in that way. But I guess, I think I have a question for you, which is to do with that thing you said about like creativity. Um, and I mean, just in your experience, where have you seen that sort of creativity manifest in, in organizing in such a way? Like, because I think again, like in the context of the, the branch I'm in, we're talking about us being creative workers, cultural workers, in which our work is marketized, commodified, like creativity is like hyper commodified. Um, and, you know, it, that, that our creativity is at stake, right? It's not to say that other people like, you know, like that's what's at stake. And I'm just interested in knowing how you've seen, or perhaps if you haven't, or I don't know what your experiences has been with sort of 
creativity and all its manifestations, not only like artistically, like, like just because that's kind of what I, I'm trying to understand. I'm also trying to understand how we can have more people unionize, like, you know, especially black and brown people, like the branch I'm in is so white, but it's, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not a resourceful and valuable space, but it's like people like me don't show up, you know, and maybe because we don't think of ourselves as workers. I didn't think myself as a worker until recently or I had to like get involved in that way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my question. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot in there. Um... Uh, and I'm not the quickest always at articulating things, but um, you've raised some really interesting points, I think. Um, firstly, United Voices of the World is a wicked union. Um, and if I was still in the UK, I'd be a member of that one with you. Um, the, um, when you talked about how, how we kind of manifest creativity, um, in organizing, it's like really what it comes down. I think a lot with with organizing, it's like if you imagine, you know, approaching someone who you know and having a conversation with them. Like, how would you approach that conversation with them? You know, like if you if you're trying to sort of unpackage what this thing is, because I think people have a lot of misconceptions about what unions are. And fundamentally, it's a quite a simple thing um, because it is just simply the, the collective voice of the workers in the workplace. Uh, and it's about people having more of a say in how their workplace is run, in the conditions that they have at their work. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, I guess the creativity com comes in, in in kind of imagining how you sort of approach different conversations with different people but also when it comes to when it comes to kind of taking action and stuff that's the most obvious one for me is is where you sort of it doesn't just have to be 10 people standing behind a banner like shouting in the street like you can do it and you can do it in many different ways and and I guess that's the exciting part as well as when you get to be creative and and that's also like something that you can get lots of people involved in as well. Like I remember when we did, we did some stuff for, because Tate were, um, the art handlers at Tate, I can't remember what that, I can't, I'm sorry, I've got a really bad memory, but um, they it was Nick Sirota was leaving, who was like the, the head of Tate. And for his leaving do, he, he they'd sent out uh, a request for people to make donations um to to like um to to maybe try to buy him a boat for his leaving do but the but a lot of the people who work at Tate are really on low wages um and so we decided to kind of to to pick it the his kind of his celebration um for his leaving do like he had a party basically at Tate Britain and we all turned up um, and we we made some banners for that and ahead of time we got together and and we designed the banners together and we we um we were kind of like uh yeah it was it was kind of a collective action together to sort of create something beautiful and 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 eye catching and stuff that we could use at this at this kind of protest and so there's those moments where you can any of those moments where you can come together and be like and sort of plan things and talk about things and use your imagination in that way um, and I think that's important as well is that in you know you will I guess you're going to be meeting regularly with the people in in your unions and and in your union, and I think that the the point is to make those meetings as ima bring imagination as much to those meetings as possible, if that makes sense. 
um, to open it up for people to kind of share what their visions are of things, not only just not only the kind of like brass tacks of organizing, but also like really what would it look like if we got our way? Like if like, you know, not to be afraid to do that, because I think we are a bit afraid to do that sometimes and we can get to kind of we can just get down to kind of. Yes, I know it's important to be practical and to and to get down to like, uh, you know, negotiations over contracts and, and conditions and things like that. But actually, like, really, what would it look like if we got our way? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. I love that. What would it look like if we got our way? What would it look like if we knew <laughs> we would get our way? <laughs> you know, thinking outside of the kind of confines, constraints and conditions of fear, which is what I guess all of these kind of toxic neoliberal capitalist colonialist agendas are built on, right? They're predicated from this really kind of noxious fear and it spreads and it's contagious. And I think once we refuse that, once we refuse the foundations of these insuperable systems of power, you know, we're, we're winning, you know, and even if that's just in spirit, that's kind of what we need to, to, I guess, bring down the system, you know, to rupture the status quo and to kind of bring these, these plural futures into being. Um, Lizzie, my love, thank you so, so much for blessing us with with your heart with your spirit with your words your poetry your your history um and i'm i'm so glad that you you you've kind of freed yourself as well from that kind of that that kind of mental prison of that 16 year old in the cafe <laughs> you know you yeah that's that's a lot you know to break these kind of these cycles right um that's and to saw you know which you're doing you're doing so abundantly and beautifully right now um yeah thank you so much for sharing and blessing us yeah we we really deeply appreciate you and um yeah i'm gonna share your email as well with the students so they can reach out to you and you can keep in touch with us and people can ask more questions. <laughs> yeah, please do, because I feel like I have, I can answer, I, after, as soon as this is over, I'll go away and I'll be like, oh, I should have said this and I should have said that. So, you know, definitely please do, yeah. Thank you, what an honor, Lizzie. Have a really, really beautiful evening. And thank, thank you. you again so much. Um, I'm going to stop recording our beautiful people. So we'll have a two minute break and then we've got the amazing, incredible Jessica Horn with us. See so, you later. See you. Bye. Big love. Bye bye. <laughs>